Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. We're continuing to move through this, and and I'm, you know, we're heading into the holiday season, the Christmas season, Thanksgiving, my my favorite time of the year, Thanksgiving. And typically, what we've done here is I've, I've sort of set aside those Sundays in December to preach a series surrounding the incarnation. But I'm really where we are in Mark's gospel. Because we always say in the Christmas season, the, the story of Jesus' birth is wonderful, but it's not the end of the story. It's the, it's the beginning of the story. We, we need to get to the cross. And I'm really persuaded for us to preach through the passion uh, in Mark uh, 15 uh, to the end of the, of the book as we go through the Christmas season. So it's going to be an interesting juxtaposition for you. We're going to be singing these wonderful hymns of the Incarnation and staring, gazing into the, to the awesome specter of the tragedy, of the passion of our Savior. Mark chapter 14, reading verses 66 to 72 today as we look at this idea of betrayal in the midst of trial. I want you to stand with me if you would and, and follow along in your Bibles. If, if you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen, but we also would like to put a Bible in your hands because it's critical to me that you have your copy of Scripture. Follow along. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. The servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. After a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down. And he wept. One of the tragic, one of the saddest passages in all of Scripture. A dear friend. The champion. The one who had pledged. Everyone else may abandon you, but I will never abandon you. And here he is. Betraying his Lord. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let's be seated and gaze into this passage today that it might instruct us about this matter. You know, I told you last week that when you get to chapter 14, verses 53, where we began studying last week, that you're, you're moving from there through chapter 15, verse 15, this section of the, of the trials. These are the narratives of the trials that Jesus faced. And, and last week, we looked at the, the three uh, Jewish trials, or, the, or the, the trials in three parts, the hearing before Annas, uh, the trial before the Sanhedrin, uh, and uh, led by Caiaphas in his house, and then the early morning session of the Sanhedrin, which would lead them to take Jesus to Pilate, and it would be the next three portions of trials, the, Pil the trial before Pilate, we're going to look at that next week, Lord willing, uh, before Herod Antipas, uh, and then before Pilate again. And between those two clusters of the most incredible mockery of justice ever perpetrated in the history of mankind is this episode of Peter. Now, first of all, let's give Peter uh, some credit. There's no indication that the other disciples were in close enough proximity to see what was going on with Jesus. They fled. Peter remained close enough, followed them apparently to this courtyard. And what's going to happen is what J.C. Ryle calls a shipwreck. Listen to his words about this. A shipwreck is a melancholy sight even when no lives are lost. It's sad to think of the destruction of property and disappointment of hopes which generally attend a shipwreck. 
It's painful to see the suffering and hardship which the ship's crew often have to undergo in their struggle to escape from drowning. Yet no shipwreck is half so melancholy a sight as the backsliding and fall of a true Christian. Though raised again by God's mercy and finally saved from hell, he loses much by his fall. Such a sight we have, have brought before our minds in these verses about Peter's betrayal. We're told in a most painful and instructive way how Peter denied his Lord. I want us to see in this text today just from three perspectives. First of all, this, the, the betrayal usually begins with yielding to a small temptation. And secondly, betrayal can happen to strong believers. And third, betrayal will lead to a painful sorrow in those who repent. Let's look at this together. First of all, this idea that betrayal usually begins with yielding to a small temptation. It's interesting to me, when you look at verses 66 and 67, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you, you also are with the Nazarene Jesus. We're, this is not a man with a sword that comes to Peter and puts a sword to his throat and says, confess Jesus or die. This is a, this is a servant girl. I mean, harmless in and of herself. And really, as commentators, if you read the commentators, they'll say it's not even clear at this point that she's accusing him of anything. She, she simply recognizes from some other association. She has seen Jesus in another setting. She's made the connection. You, you were with him, you, with the Nazarene Jesus. It's just an observation. Folks, backsliding, falling away, stumbling in the, in the journey, doesn't often begin with the huge thing. Well, take the anatomy of adultery, for example. When a believer is caught in the moral failure of adultery, it, it, it seldom starts with just a upfront, let's go commit adultery. It's, it's a small thing. It's a, it's a look. It's a glance. It's a word. It's, a, it's an occasion. It's an opportunity. It's a dwelling on something you shouldn't dwell on. It's, it's small enough, and we need to take, take note of this. If we've been watching Peter in that courtyard, warming himself by the fire, we would have thought initially, wow, Peter stands out here because, because everybody else is gone. Peter at least has followed the crowd to where Jesus is to, to stay in close proximity. I don't think any one of us, apart from Jesus prophesying that Peter would deny him, none of us would have observed the occasion as going where it was going to go. And if we had heard the young lady say to him, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus, none of us could have predicted his response. But look at it. It's awful. You see, it starts small enough. The psalm we read is has some painful parts to it. The psalmist says, speaking prophetically, verse 12, it's not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. You expect an enemy to be your enemy. It's not an adversary who deals insolently with me then I can hide from him. But it's you. It's you. A man, my equal. In other words, my, my fellow man. My companion. My familiar friend. There are few pains greater in life than the pain of betrayal of one who has called himself your friend. This is the pain that's going on here. When you talk about the disciples, ask anyone, name the disciples. 
And 99% of people who know the disciples will name them with this order. Peter, James, Peter, Peter. Peter's always the first one come. There was no disciple who seemed to stand for Jesus more than he did. John, we could argue, the beloved disciple was the youngest. He was, he was the one physically in proximity closest to Jesus. Peter, though, was the ultimate companion. The rock. We need to take heed from this passage. If the rock can stumble, we better guard our hearts. We need to do this. We need to learn to guard against small temptations. There are no harmless temptations. I told you about the man in the iron cage in Pilgrim's Progress. You need to go read Pilgrim's Progress, that section where, where the interpreter takes Pilgrim after he's come through the gate and his burden's fallen off his back. He takes him through the interpreter's house. That is, it's lessons that the Holy Spirit gives the early, the, the young believer. He takes him to this room where there's a man in an iron cage. He's miserable. He's pathetic. Christian asks the interpreter, what, what happened to this man? He said, ask him. And the man in the iron cage says, I once... In the language of the language of this Elizabethan English. I once was a, fl a fair, flourishing believer. In other words, I once was growing. I was growing, but then I laid the reins on the neck of my lusts. Now, if you are around horses, you you get that picture immediately. I laid the reins on the neck of my lusts rather than keeping them in check. And now I am as you see me. There's no harmless temptation to sin. Now thank God, temptation to sin is not the same as sin. But one of the things we pray, we're taught to pray by our Savior is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Martin Luther said, distinguishing temptation to sin from sinning itself, while you cannot control the birds flying over your head, you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Temptations are all around us every day. We live in, a, in, a, in an age saturated with it bombarded by it. Peter gives in to the temptation. He's at a crossroads here. You also are with the Nazarene. We need to remember that Paul taught the Philippians Chapter 4, verse 22, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but the connection is through Christ. If we neglect the means of grace, we grieve the Spirit. And if we grieve the Spirit, then, then we will be susceptible to falling into temptation, to succumbing to temptation, moving from being tempted to sinning as a result of the temptation would remind you quickly that the means of grace that God has given us are the, are the prayer, uh, time of prayer unto Him, the reading of His Word, the fellowshipping with other believers. You're not meant to walk this world by yourself. If you were, Jesus could have covered twice the territory. Rather than sending the twelve out two by two, He could have sent them out one by one, covered twice the territory. It wasn't about geography. It was about sanctification. Fellowship with other believers, worship, the person habitually abandons the opportunity to gather with the people of God in worship, putting his or her soul in jeopardy, in danger. 
witnessing. Brother, sister, it's a shorter path than you think to, to being verbally silent and not witnessing of the gospel to where a silence moves to denial. We've got to take a lesson from Peter and commit under God. I will not neglect the means of grace. And we're going to, if, you, if you're already on the path, we're going to talk about that in a moment. But learn from this. It usually begins with a yielding to a small temptation. Secondly, I want you to see that the betrayal can happen to strong believers. This little girl has just made an observation, but look at verses 68 and following. He denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. What are you talking about? Why would you associate me with him? And he got up and moved into the gateway. He moved away from the fire. He was there to warm himself by the fire. But, but you see, it's, it's a fascinating thing that happens too, by the way. When you go, begin to go down the path of denial of Jesus and betrayal of your commitment to him, you move yourself from the relationship. There's a powerful figure here. The person who is who is yielding to temptation and, and and turning his back on the things of God is will distance himself from the warmth of the relationship that he or she has with the Savior. Guess what else? That person will distance himself from the fellowship of believers. It's been a fascinating thing for me to study for more than 40 years. The people who begin to go down the wrong path, not the path of the obedient disciple, but the, but, the, but the way that seems right to men, but the end thereof is the way of death. When they begin to do that, they will remove them, they will withdraw. You've seen it happen. They will withdraw themselves from the assembly of the people of God. And, and they will withdraw themselves from you. You could have close fellowship with them, one or two or three together, and they will withdraw themselves from you. They will not come to the light, for their deeds are evil. It's a biblical principle. It, it, it never fails. I've watched it happen through the years. He moves from the warmth of the fire to the, to the gateway, trying to take himself out of the light that she has thrown on him. You were also with the Nazarene, Jesus. He denies it, physically removes himself from that. In verse 69, the servant girl saw him. I don't know if she's moving about her, her business, whatever she's doing there, and she comes across him now at the gateway. He's, he's not by the fire anymore. And began to say to the bystanders, this, this man's one of them. Now, that seems like she's making the accusation at this point. This man's one of them. Think about it, brothers and sisters. <laughs> He's been accused of being a follower of Jesus. And the good news is, if you go forward to the book of Acts, when they're accused of being followers of Jesus and they're beaten, they go away rejoicing, why? That they had been counted worthy of being identified with Jesus. That's not where Peter is tonight, this night. This man's one of them. But again, he denied it, verse 70. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them. For you're a Galilean. They picked up the dialect. Judean Jews and Galilean Jews had different dialects. I've got some friends. I'm a native of Texas. I think I've been out of Texas long enough that you, you don't hear the Texas twang. But some people say you do. But I've got some friends that are natives of Texas still live in Texas. And, well, Bill, I just guess. I mean, it's, and you, you know immediately, this, this fellow, I mean, where, you want to say, where'd you park your horse? It's, you just, you know this guy is, 
picked it up from the dialect. Do that all over this country. There are people you, you can you can hear if they're from the Northeast. If they're from Boston. You know they're from Boston. Well, that's what's happening here. Certainly, you are one of them. Now then, one of them. See, it's it's gone from you were with the Nazarene Jesus to you were one of them. You're. Everything they're charging this fellow with is a charge that should be laid to you. You're one of that band of insurrectionists determined to bring Pilate's wrath on our head. Now watch, watch what happens. When you, when you neglect the means of grace, when you, when you step down the path of yielding to temptation, you go from, as you can see it moving here, I don't know what you're talking about. To refusing to answer. To finally cursing. He invoked a curse on himself. And you, you get the idea probably what it was. There, was, there were, there were uh, vows taken. Uh, Jesus had taught in the Sermon on the Mount. So Peter is going against that even. Jesus had taught in the Sermon on the Mount, don't, don't swear by your head. And you get the, get the sense that Peter says something like, may my, may my head be lopped off if I'm not telling the truth. He put in folks, may, may I be cursed somehow if I'm, if I'm lying about this. I do not know this man. And I don't know who you're talking about, this Jesus. Once a person yields to temptation, mark this down, brothers and sisters, once you give in to sin, there is no limit to where you can go. No one who knew Peter and had watched him operate as one of the disciples could ever have imagined. In fact, it must have seemed shocking to the, the disciples to hear Jesus say, you will deny me. Denial it has different degrees even. It's where I don't, I don't want to be associated with you. It's, it's where uh, you're with someone. someone approaches that you know has disdain for that person and you distance yourself because you don't want to be identified it, it can be a failure to speak up for when when uh, this happens on the school ground when, when a bully zeroes in on someone who's your friend and you just back away and let it happen that's betrayal you didn't participate in the bullying you you didn't participate in the in the savaging of the person verbally or otherwise but you remove. Well, that's happening here, but there's worse that happens. It, it's, take that analogy. If you were then to add in and start, start hurling invectives at that person and participating with the bullying verbally or physically, this is where Peter is at this point. He, is, he has sworn a curse upon his own life to say, I want to tell you how intense, intensely you need to understand that I don't know this man. I don't even know who you're talking about. It, it is, it, it's, it takes your breath away when you read it. This is the one about whom Jesus had said and recorded in Matthew 16 at that great high moment of Caesarea Philippi. Who do men say that I am? Well, they say this and this. Well, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ. You're, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, you are blessed, highly favored Simon, son of John. For you just spoken not something that, that, that you would mentally work through. What you've spoken is divine revelation. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed this to you. And I tell you, you will no longer be seen as a little stone, 
shall be seen as Peter, a rock. And it's on such bold confessions of faith as this that I will build my church. Now, and that same person cursingly denies him and betrays him. Jesus had, had healed Peter's mother-in-law had taken Peter up to the Mount of Transfiguration, saved him from drowning in the Sea of Galilee. Brothers and sisters, he did this, Peter did this in the face of having been warned that it would happen. All we need to take heart Spurgeon may not have been the original to say this, but I think he's the first one I ever read that said it. He said, remember that the best of men, and this would be, and women, are at their best still just men. There's no super Christians who live above the plains of battling remaining sin. Even after conversion, after experiencing the beginning of the renewal by the Holy Spirit, we still battle remaining sin. And the key word there is battle. Because if you're not battling remaining sin, you're going to give in to it. We need to watch daily, pray in humility. The scripture warns that the person who thinks he stands upright needs to take heed lest he fall. Warns us that pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit goes before a fall. You see, Peter so quickly saying, I will never, I won't do it. was a proud man. He should have learned the lesson that humbly you say, Oh Lord, may it not be so. Oh God, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from that evil. But you see, Peter's not the only one. Read the history of Scripture. Noah, Abraham, David, Hezekiah. The infection of sin remains even in the people who've been born again. And we should walk humbly with our Lord. It should humble us. Proverbs 8, 20, 28, 14 says, Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. But whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. And you see it happening in just a brief span of time with Peter. He goes, don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this man, blankety, blankety, blank. You see the hardening is taking place there. Third, I want you to see that, that betrayal will lead to a painful sorrow in those who repent. You see, one of two things happens. In fact, it really is the measure that when you find out where a person is spiritually is when, when life presses in. And it's not even so much do they walk the straight and narrow without stumbling or do they not. It's really... Do they repent? I've said this to you for 11 years now. Because we deal with remaining sin and because we live in a sinful world with sinful choices and we're not in glory yet where there will be no more sin and no more sinful choices, we're going to face the challenge of temptation every day. And when we stumble, do we repent? Because see, the people who do not repent when they stumble will be hardened. And what they prove ultimately is, as one of my professors said in seminary, a faith that fizzles was false from the first. And you don't know that until you see how a person responds to remaining sin in his or her life. The most redeeming words in this passage 
Verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Thank God the text doesn't say and he began to make excuses for why he did it. No. Thank God the text says and he broke down and wept. He wept. You see, the believer, the true believer, is not immune to remaining sin. And when the true believer sins, he or she repents. It's one of the infallible marks of being a follower of Jesus. If you've been justified by faith in Jesus Christ, then you don't try to justify yourself. You thank God that He loves us enough that through the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, He would be willing, as we put faith in Christ, He would be willing to forgive us our sin and to treat us as if we never had sinned, to, to cancel our debt and consider us righteous for the sake of Christ. But there's great sorrow there. Peter did not say, well, you know, I, 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 the rooster crowed. Yeah, he did tell me I would do this, you know. But thank God we're forgiven. You know, no one's perfect. That, that's not what's happening here. That attitude's cavalier. When you hear somebody talk that way, you know that they know nothing of the, of the grace of God. It's weeping over sin. I want to ask you, when's the last time you wept over your sin? The rock wept over his sin. He remembered. And while what he remembered was the specific warning, dear brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this, that it's the remembering of the Word of God that is redemptive to us. It is the witness of the Spirit who points at us and says, you are the man. You're the one I'm talking about, as Nathan did to David when he confronted him in his sin. See, Proverbs 14, 14 tells us that the backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways. And a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. It's the fruit of righteousness. Saul of Tarsus lived his entire life as a believer, remembering that he had consented to the murder of Christians. He never got beyond that. David the king after God's own heart limped home to glory. When, when you read the 23rd Psalm, you're reading David toward the end of his life. He limped home to glory because the sword did not depart from his house once he had taken Bathsheba as his wife unlawfully and immorally and had her husband murdered to cover it up. But you don't have to limp home to glory. There is a better way. You see, it's as if you're running after another God. You, you, you have no other gods before you. And God is your God whom you acknowledge. You deny Him, there's another God in play here. And Psalm 16, 4 says, The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Sorrows multiply. Peter had heard Jesus teach as recorded in Matthew 10, whoever denies me before men, I also will deny my father before my father who is in heaven. In Luke 9, 26, that whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. So I ask myself, as I ask you, am I living a life acknowledging Jesus or am I living a life denying Jesus? Thank God Peter recovered from this. You may remember his recovery. It's recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 21. It's it began when Peter, when Jesus appears post-resurrection and says to the disciples, go tell the disciples and Peter. 
What a mercy. What a mercy. You see, because Peter, at that point, Peter had no, no delusions that he'd be considered one of the disciples. Because he had denied being one of them. Go tell the disciples and Peter. And Jesus takes Peter aside in, in John's gospel. And he'll do this for you. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And, and the commentators are divided as whether he's talking about more than, more than the fishing gear that you'd gone back to. You said, I'm going fishing. Or do you love me more than these others love me? And it's a great exchange. And I, 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 I preached on this before, so I won't redevelop this more. But simply to say, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, do you, do you agape me? Love me unconditionally? Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. You know I love you like a friend. It's the first time he asked. Second time he asked him, Simon, do you, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? Peter says, Lord, you know I, you know I phileo you. You know I love you as a friend. See, he couldn't bring himself to say, I love you unconditionally because he, conditions had been applied and he had denied him. And then Jesus says the third time, Simon, do you phileo me? Do you really love me as a friend? And the text tells us Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time. And then Jesus tells Peter what he's going to do. And that's when Peter knows he's been forgiven. You see, Jesus hasn't confronted him to rub his nose in his sin. He has confronted him to show him the power of forgiveness with God. And he'll do the same to you. He did it to our first father, Adam. Adam had sinned and Eve had sinned and they were hiding from God. And God comes to pronounce the consequences of their sin. And he says in the midst of that, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And it's the first serpent. It's the first time they hear anything about a future that she is going to have children. And he names her Eve, for she shall be mother of all the living. It's a, it's a message of hope. God has forgiven. God has redeemed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to learn from Peter. He had many privileges and blessings in terms of the, of the nearness of, of the Lord's physical presence. And yet, he squandered those. He sinned. You and I have the ministry of the Holy Spirit today and the Scripture in its full content. And, and if, we're not, if we are not careful, we don't guard our hearts, we will sin. And when we do, we need to recognize that there is forgiveness with God. We don't, we don't sin because we know we're going to be forgiven. In fact, the Puritan John Owen said, While it's been promised that everyone who repents will be forgiven, nowhere has it been promised that everyone who sins will be given repentance. Jesus was in the midst of great trial. He needed his friend. Jesus sits enthroned in heaven today. He demands our faithfulness. A lot of folks can be talking about Jesus in the weeks to come. But don't usually mention him the rest of the year. Will you acknowledge him before men? Will you be willing to be identified with him? I told you, it's going to cost increasingly so in this country. We've not fixed the secular, satanic attitude that pervades this nation. It was not fixed on November 8th. A lot of things can happen that will be good for the country Christian will you acknowledge him because denial is betrayal 
And I pray for myself as I pray for you that we will be found faithful, whatever comes. We watched the insanity of God together last Sunday night. People paying an unspeakable price to be identified with Jesus. May God give us grace. While there's very little price to pay, to be gladly identified with Him, to share the good news with others. Tell them there is a Savior who saves sinners. And you and I know this because we're sinners. And He saved us. Repent of your sin. Never run away from it. Never let the devil lie to you. Repent of it. Be forgiven. Not yield to temptation and the tragic effects, the consequences that come with it all the time. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, again we bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for the cross. It shows infallibly your love for sinners, Jesus' effectual death in our place, bearing there our sin, satisfying your divine justice by suffering and dying in our place, rising from the grave three days later, and Lord, and ascending and reigning and ruling on high and praying for us today, Lord, deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. Help us to encourage one another, provoke one another to love and good works, to employ the means of grace that we not succumb and help us to recognize the subtlety of temptation. And be a people who help one another on the way. We're going we're gonna to meet people this week, this afternoon. Help us to boldly, lovingly, compellingly, compassionately tell them of the Savior's love gladly be identified with him whatever that may mean and whatever that may cost we ask it in Jesus name Amen